the other weekend? <laughs> so I spent Saturday in a gym fighting a little bit of crud. So I just took it easy yesterday. Made some chili. Nice. Chili is award winning chili. I watched the second half of the third. I mean, obviously, I Okay. Hey, uh, we're recording, going to get started, okay? Uh, last slide I had up here, guys, is uh, over the German 88 millimeter gun, okay? And so this next slide, this is after conquering Poland. What we're going to get, guys, is six months uh, in Europe with no war. Uh, so historians refer to this as the phony war, okay? And so as... I want to review with you guys and also look at the map, which I have up on the board. So don't worry, I will give you time to write that down. But we're going to look at this map and review where we've been and where we're going. You guys can help me fill it out as practice. Yay! Yes. Don't get too disappointed. Italy. Italy. Right? Yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 We're gonna start over here. London, England. Okay, you got London. Okay. Great Britain. United Kingdom. Okay. And uh, what is this body of water here? English Channel. Okay, the English Channel. Okay, at its narrowest point, it's 20 miles from the continent. Okay, here is a place called Pa de Calais. P A S A Pa de Calais. And then there's Dover right here. Okay, so a lot of times this is referred to as the Dover Strait. Okay, on a clear day from the coast of France, you can see the cliffs of England, white cliffs of England. Okay, on a clear day. Now, this body of water is known for its fast currents and rough currents, okay, because you've got an ocean leading in through here, right? Um, and so, and then it narrows at the 20 mile point, so you get fast currents uh, and rough seas a lot of times in the English Channel. Not always, okay? All right, we come across the channel, and what do we have here? What country is this? France. France, and the capital is? Okay, let's stay up here. What's this big country here? Belgium. And the capital? Brussels. What's this little one here? Luxembourg. And the, actually, the capital, guys, is Luxembourg City. What's that? I think so. Well, no, I mean, Luxembourg has other cities. They have towns and cities and stuff. Right? Yeah, basically all over there. Okay. Uh, what's this country? Netherlands. Netherlands capital? Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, I forgot this one here. Denmark. Denmark capital? <laughs> Denmark? Copenhagen. Norway? Capital, Oslo. Okay. All right, we got to come down here. That's Switzerland. And what's the capital? Bern. Okay. What's this? Germany. Okay, Canada. Germany. Capital. Hello. Down here. Austria. Austria. Capital. Vienna. Vienna. Italy, Roma. Okay, what we got over here? Got Czechoslovakia. What's capital Czechoslovakia? Prague. Poland and the capital. And what we got over here? Capital. Okay. Very good. Now, let's review. 
1938, or actually, let's start with 1936. This region here is known as what? The Rhineland. It's DMZ. Okay. Hitler's not supposed to put any troops there. He does. And this is Nazi Germany. Okay. And then his next conquest in 1938, he will take Austria, annex it, make it his own. And then this region here called what? Sudetenland. Okay, Hitler will be given this by the British and the French. Thank you, Neville Chamberlain, okay, for caving to Hitler. And then he will take the rest of the country, yes? And then with the Molotov-Ribbentrop or non-aggression pact, Germans will invade on September 1st, 1939. And within a month, this will be divided between these two powers. Yes? Okay, so by the end of September, this affair is over. You got October, November, December, January, February, March, April. So you got about six months here. Hitler, we know his ultimate goal is this, yes? For living room or living room or living space, Lebensraum, okay, for the German people. But he cannot leave his rear exposed. He doesn't want a two-front war, so he's got to deal with Western Europe next. So over the next six months, he's going to use his highway system that he developed, called the what? Autobahn. The Autobahn, to move his troops back across from Poland into position to attack Western Europe. Okay. And you, if you read that slide while it was up a minute ago, he is going to conquer six countries in the span of about nine weeks using what type of warfare? Blitzkrieg, okay? He's also going to start using paratroopers. You guys know what a paratrooper is? The ones that jump out of planes, okay? So they can be dropped in strategic locations. Uh, to secure strategic locations and hold those from the enemy. Uh, oftentimes, those are bridges, okay? Um, because you're, the people you're invading may try and blow bridges, which make it harder for you to move across the land. Does that make sense? So you want to secure those bridges so they don't blow them up. It makes it easier for you to move, okay? So we're going to start with Denmark. All right, now, Denmark is willing to fight. They're going to fight, but it's futile, guys. They will use paratroopers here in Denmark, okay, to secure key locations and then start bombing campaigns, which this is the first time people have ever been bombed, you understand, in these countries. They've never been bombed before. And so it's going to create refugees. It's going to create fear, and it's going to create submission. Okay, so the Germans will take Denmark. Now, in all of these countries, guys, throughout the war, you're going to see resistance to the Nazis. Okay, in some countries, that resistance is more organized uh, and more effective. I mean, in the Warsaw ghettos of Poland, you're going to see a couple of uprisings, one by Jews, one by Poles and Jews. Okay, uh, you will see resistance here. And in Norway, what's really most important about Norway is its west coast, okay? Norway, on the, on the North Sea here, you can see its proximity to Great Britain, okay? And one of the options the Germans have in dealing with Great Britain is to choke it, not allow any shipping in or out. So if the Germans can control the North Sea and the English Channel, this will make it difficult for supplies to get into Britain. And so the goal for the Germans is to take these important ports and airways or <coughs> air landing strips on the west coast of Norway. So they will not take the whole of Norway, but they're going to use with a Trojan horse to take these ports in Norway. So they will bring in cargo ships, merchant ships, into these ports. Okay, and inside these cargo ships are German troops and tanks. So when the sun sets, 
his troops come out and take control of those ports, which have very little, you know, very little defense there. Okay, so during the war, like I said, there will be resistance here against the Germans that control this, but if they control airfields over here, of course they can bomb from here, bomb Britain from there, yes? Now, there's a movie out there called Max Manus, and it's about the, uh, the Norwegian resistance to the Nazis, and the leader of the resistance was this guy, Max. And what they would do is they'd come over to Britain and get explosives, C4, dynamite, that sort of thing, okay? And then sneak back into these ports, oftentimes with, like, canoes, and attach explosives to German ships and blow, blow holes in them while they were in Norwegian ports. And they were a nuisance throughout the war. And I think Max Manus actually survived the war, okay? Then we go back to World War I. In World War I, the Germans invaded France through the Low Countries, Netherlands and Belgium. They call them the Low Countries for some reason, all right? So the general that pulled this off in World War I was a guy named Schieffen, General Schieffen. So this is known as the Schieffen Plan. Okay, now, when Denmark and Norway and Poland were attacked, the British started sending troops here. Okay, so the British have troops in here. Now, the French have been preparing for this day since the end of World War I. First, you had the DMZ, where no German troops were allowed. But that wasn't enough. What the, what the French built along here is a 350-mile-long line of defenses called the Maginot Line. Maginot Line, okay? Now, guys, much of this is built underground or into the ground uh, to make it stronger. These are concrete fortresses. They have actually pillboxes that will come up out of the ground that can fire on cannon. They have a railway system built underground, not full-size railway, but a smaller railway, uh, like you like see at the zoo, okay, that would go underground. Uh, and transport troops from one part of the line to another, okay, depending on where the attack may come from. So the French really felt like their nation was impregnable, that the Germans could not break through that line, right? And, but they did not build that line up here with the, quarter, with the border with uh, Belgium. I mean, Belgium's a neutral country, and the Germans wouldn't invade through a neutral country, would they? But they did in World War One. So in World War II, they're going to repeat the same plan. Now, you see all these dots right here? What does that represent? A map. A bunch of dots like that. Yeah, the Ardennes Forest. Okay, this is dense, hilly, mountainous, a lot of rivers and streams that run through it. French thought that the Germans would not be able to send a mechanized army through that forest, okay? You heard of German engineering? Okay, the German engineers will clear a path and build pontoon bridges and so forth across those rivers and streams to move a mechanized army through there, okay? Now, so the Schieffen plan starts with Blitzkrieg with the bombing of these two countries, okay? With the the Yunkers 88. That is going to create a bunch of refugees. These refugees from the Netherlands and Belgium, if they're fleeing the war, which way are they going to flee? They're going to flee towards France, right? We're talking about tens of thousands of people carrying whatever they can carry, leaving their homes and heading west. Okay. Now, these paratroopers, Blitzkrieg, they come in and they're moving quickly through these two countries, okay? They will come through Belgium, and the British are going to try and counterattack into Belgium, all right? There's only a few roads that go in, you know, major thoroughfares that go into Belgium from France, 
And as the British start coming into Belgium, they are met by all these refugees. And the refugees will not get off the roads. They will not move for the British Army. There's a reason why. Because as they're moving across Belgium, these refugees, you can see them from the air. German pilots, anytime these, these refugees get off the road, the fighter planes will come by and strafe fire machine gun fire on the side of the road to push them back onto the road. They wanted these refugees to clog the road. So when the British try to counterattack and come into Belgium, they're met by all these refugees, and they won't move. Okay, so that stalls the British, and then right behind these refugees comes the German army. Okay, so the British are going to actually be repelled by both refugees and the Germans. And they will flee back to the coast here. The Germans will push through the Maginot Line. They will push through the Ardennes uh, forest here. Okay, and they will cut to the sea. And then these French, these German troops will cut north and then fan out and take Paris. So any British and French troops in here are caught. Okay. And they're going to start fleeing to the coast to a place called Dunkirk, okay, which some of you may have heard of. All right. So that's where we're at. France will fall in two weeks. The Germans couldn't do in four years. In World War I, they will do in two weeks. And that's what these notes explain. One thing that's kind of funny, uh, when you had that six month period, the Germans on the other side of the Maginot line send messages over to the French troops say hey the British troops are in the rear in your towns in your cities with your women trying to make the French upset okay this is a picture of kind of the remnants of the Maginot line okay and this picture obviously kind of a frightening picture of Hitler standing in front of the Eiffel Tower um, that picture is published in newspapers all over the world. Okay, so it's undeniable that Germany is winning this war. The British are in trouble, and they will turn to this man, Winston Churchill. Gotta love it. Smoking a cigar, pinstripe suit, looks like a gangster. Okay. And it is a sad sight to see Paris fall to the Germans. Um, at the end of uh, World War I, the armistice on the 11th day of the 11th month, 11th hour, uh, Germany surrendered in a railroad car. And the French took that railroad car and they put it in a park in Paris and built a monument commemorating the end of World War One. So Hitler naturally is going to have the French surrender in that same railroad car in Paris. And guys, Hitler is riding hot. There's video of this. Standing outside the railroad car, inside the railroad car, you can see Hitler just, he's excited. You know what I mean? What he started in 1919, with the German Workers' Party way back in 1919 to avenge Germany of the Treaty of Versailles, he has done so. Okay? He has met that, that aim, that goal. Okay? Now, many people fear that there will soon be a photograph of Hitler not too long from now in front of 
the name of that? London Tower? Big Ben, the clock, yeah. That a similar picture will be taken. The other thing the British started doing, once the war with Poland began, okay, once the invasion of Poland began, was Britain was worried that the Germans would start bombing Britain. And they would bomb their cities. They would bomb London. They would bomb Manchester, Liverpool, big cities. And so the British started doing what with their children? Yeah, the British government requisitioned over 20,000 estates in rural Britain. Any Downton Abbey fans? I, I watched the whole thing. Uh, that was a wife thing. Yeah. But actually, it's really well written. Very, very good show. Um, anyhow, that's a, that's those type of estates would house children. Guys, three million British children would be sent to the countryside. Now, they're there for six months during the phony war, okay? Because they started doing this right after Poland was invaded. And so these kids are there. There's no war. You know what I mean? Like six months later, eight months later, there's still no war for Britain, at least not on their soil. Okay, keep that in mind a little bit later as we talk about this. So the British are in trouble. Uh, the French are defeated, and they're in trouble. These two maps kind of show you, okay, what, what we're talking about here. There's some paratroopers there. Okay, so as the as the Germans came through, the British tried to counterattack, okay, push back, and they will retreat to here to Dunkirk. This also shows it here, okay. Uh, the Germans broke through the Ardennes forest. They did break through the Maginot Line, cut to the coast, and fan out. Now, the bulk of the British Army is in France. They're retreating. Churchill is going to call on anybody, any person in Britain that has a boat. Doesn't matter what kind of boat, be a tugboat, fishing boat, sailboat, ski boat, yacht, whatever. Get it to rowboats, those two. Get them to the coast and get them to the coast as soon as you can. Because they're going to create a fleet of ships to try and save these soldiers. The problem with Dunkirk, guys, is there's no good harbors. I mean, there's one harbor where you could bring in some larger ships. The Germans control the skies. So if you start bringing in your big ships, the Germans are going to sink them. Okay? So they're going to use a flotilla of many different kinds of boats. You can see a bunch right here tied together. They're going to drag them across the, the channel, hoping to save these soldiers. Now, the Germans were moving so fast. And this is something a lot of people don't think about during war. It's logistics, supply lines. When your army is just moving so quickly, the Germans actually had to pause for about 48 hours to allow fuel supplies to catch up to their army. Okay, That delay is going to allow for the British to get these troops off the beach. It becomes known as the miracle of Dunkirk. Okay where they will pluck 200,000 British and 140,000 French troops off those beaches and save them from being captured or killed. This is, like I said, the bulk of the British Army. So what you would refer to this to is kind of what's called a Pyrrhic victory. Okay, You don't win, but it's like a moral victory. It's an evacuation. You just got your butts kicked. Okay. But you saved your army, kind of like Washington did during the Revolution a lot. Okay, save the army, never give up the army. Okay, so this becomes a rallying cry for the British. Let's get them back from Dunkirk. Yeah.
The general? Uh, not sure of the British general. It could have been Montgomery, but I don't know if he was in charge of the 8th Army yet. Um, but the prime minister was, you know, Churchill. He was the one behind him. Yeah. yeah. I just remember from the movies. There was one in France? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that guy's name. Yeah. yeah. How many did you did see the movie Dunkirk? Okay. That was out like two summers ago. During your sophomore year, blockbuster movie coming out about Dunkirk, and three of you saw it. What's wrong with you people? You saw it at home? Listen, I, I, when I heard this movie was coming out, I was like, awesome, I'm stoked, right? This is going to be great, because uh, I teach about this and everything. And so I went and saw the movie. I wasn't really disappointed. But if you don't know the background, they don't really explain it. You know what I mean? Like, they don't really tell you what's going on. You have to know the history before you go. So I told people, if you go see it, read about Dunkirk, you know, just look it up on Wikipedia. At least you'll know what's going on, okay? Because yeah. you could really be confused by it if you didn't know this stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I thought he did a good job. With that. Um, but yeah, so you can see like they built a, a, a bridge, basically a boat so people could get off the beach. Um, you see this rowboat. I mean, there's so many different stories about this, but like these two brothers rode the boat back and forth to the ship uh, for like 48 hours straight. Now, the, the Germans are bombing the coast. At the same time, strafing it with fighter planes. At the same time, these people are trying to escape. You can see here guys swimming, explosions going off in the background. Um, they left behind on the beaches uh, 2,472 guns. That's artillery pieces, not rifles, okay? Artillery pieces. Uh, 84,000 vehicles uh, and all kinds of ammunition and, and so forth were left behind on the beach. Uh, but they saved the men to fight another. Uh, and they knew what they were up against. Because it's going to be four years before we come back on these same beaches. Not the exact same beaches, but that same coastline. Uh, it's going to be four years before we do that. Okay, that's a long time. Um, so we know what we're up against. And uh, the British will, you know, like I said, save a, a lot of their men. This is the Dover Strait. This is the narrowest point. So they were actually a little bit further trying to get these boats over there and so forth. And uh, yeah, I, I recommend the movie. What do we got here? Let's see if they've taken this down. Okay. Okay, so uh, remember the stupid dive bombers I've been telling you about? This is from the movie. Get this back around. Get some volume here.
near the end of the movie. Almost paid, baby. Keep coming around. Keep coming. The body body's gonna talk to stones. All you need to see them. No, no, no way. They seem to commit to his life. Actually, a British plane that uh, was out of fuel that shot down. I just didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a good movie, um, but you enjoy it a lot more knowing kind of what was going on. Um, and, and, you know, how successful it is um, at saving these men. So, guys, like I said, France... France surrenders. Uh, you can see, like, a minor ca counterattack here. It, it will not. I mean, two weeks. It's, it's crazy how fast the French fall here. Um, and so what we look at next is, like, what happens to France? Okay. And what happens with Britain here? <laughs> and so I, I, I apologize if I offend any uh, French folks in here with this political cartoon here. Okay. It's a little bit cruel. But when the French do surrender, um, obviously the northern part and the coastal areas of France are very important and susceptible to invasion by the Allies. Okay, so the Germans are going to occupy these, this zone of France. So you'll see a lot of German troops here in France. Okay, you can see Britain up here. Here's Dunkirk. Okay, the southern France will be known as Vichy. France. That's the capital of the southern part of France. This will become known as a puppet state. Okay, so the French will remain in charge. There will be some but few German troops in the south of France, um, and the French will basically take orders from the Germans there, as a puppet would. Okay, that also includes. Now you got to start thinking about. You know, France. France is a global power, so French colonies like. French Morocco, French Algiers, and even in Southeast Asia, they have colonies down there, like what? French Indochina, okay, which all makes all of their possessions overseas or in other places vulnerable because the Germans have conquered them in their home country. You follow me? So these these places will also become known as uh, puppet states, okay, where the, the French will remain in charge, but the Germans will give them the orders. You follow me? Now, let me tell you about a, a kind of a sticky situation we've got here, guys. Do you remember the Five Power Treaty? That was the one to limit the size of navies. Okay, the big five, U.S., Great Britain, France, Italy, Japan at the time. And who was the first to violate this treaty? France. So France had been rebuilding its navy during those years and out of fear of Mussolini mostly. And what happens to the French navy now that they've surrendered to the Germans? That French Navy is very strong. And if you combine the French Navy with the German Navy, now the German Navy would rival that of the Royal Navy, of the British Navy. Follow me? So what happens? Well, guys, Churchill is very concerned about this. He does not want the French fleet to fall into German hands. And so Churchill calls upon French leaders and French admirals to sail their ships into British harbors. Now, British harbors can be found all over the world. 
when you can set, sail them to Egypt, you can sail them up to Britain, up to the up to the English Channel. You can sail to Canada if you wanted to, or India, or Australia, wherever you want to go. Just don't surrender to the Germans. Your ships. And many of the French admirals complied with this, but some of their larger battleships and destroyers that were in the Mediterranean had not followed these orders. So Churchill ordered his couple of his destroyers into the Mediterranean to go get these French ships and have them follow out of the Mediterranean. Some of the French commanders refused to comply. Now, if you're a French admiral, at this point in 1940, who do you think is going to win this war? Yeah, the Germans are winning. They're winning everywhere and quickly. So if you're a French commander, you might be like, I'll just surrender to the Germans and hopefully they'll, you know, treat, treat us good. What Churchill ended up having to do was destroy some of the French fleet. Their ally. They would bomb from the air and from the sea some of these French ships, killing French sailors sinking French ships. Many French still have not forgiven the British for this. But the British have their back to the wall. The continent of Europe is, is overrun. And what does the United States do? I mean, after the Phony War, that would have been, hey, maybe that's the last straw when they invade our friend France. We're going to go help, right? We're not. And now our best friend, Britain, has their back to the wall. Now, we are sending supplies, okay, but not with our own ships. Because if we start using our own ships and escorting those with our destroyers, our destroyers are going to get sunk. And we're going to be drawn into this war, and we don't want to end this war. So Churchill's on his own. This is a very tough decision to sink parts of the French fleet, but he will do it. It's about survival at this point, okay? So, what do I got? Mm. How much time we got? Ten minutes. We're ahead. Should I continue? Do one more slide? Yeah. One more. One more slide. We can stay ahead of second round. Yeah. One more slide. One more slide. Guys, we're going to take a pause before we do the Battle of Britain. We're going to come back across the pond and talk about American air power development. Okay. So during all this time of isolation, we will rearm. But the guy that really is the person that is pushing this is Billy Mitchell. I mentioned Billy Mitchell near the beginning of class when we talked about World War I. He was America's first ace. Okay, so he's an American hero. Okay, and he saw that air power was the, like the new thing. Like this was going to be big coming out of World War I. So he tried to convince the Army and the Navy to invest in military aircraft. Bombers, fighters, better planes. The Army and the Navy were resistant to change here. So Mitchell decided to put on a demonstration. This is an old World War I destroyer, the USS Alabama. We weren't going to use it anymore. So Mitchell dropped six 2,000-pound bombs from the USS Alabama. <laughs> That's what it looked like. So at this point, the light bulb's supposed to go off. You're like, oh, man, that's a really effective tool of war. But it didn't. The light bulb didn't go off. So Mitchell, this is 1921, so shortly after World War I, okay, they still resist. And so Mitchell does something you're not supposed to do in the military. That is, break the chain of command. And he went above his superior officer's head to complain that we weren't 
keeping pace with the rest of the world here. And he got court-martialed. Okay? American hero, our first ace, Billy Mitchell, gets court-martialed. After Lindbergh, Lindbergh's flight in 1927, the Army started to say, all right, yeah, okay, maybe we need to start investing in this stuff. Okay? So by the early 30s, and especially mid-30s, uh, we will start building aircraft, lots of them, okay? in places like Wichita, Kansas. All right? And I'll pick up on that story. Um, we're also going to start building uh, naval aircraft as well. I'll pick up on the rest of that story uh, tomorrow. Okay. And yeah, check out that movie Dunkirk. 